since we last talked, have you gotten any further into uh, at Baldur's Gate? Like, I'm on my second oh. campaign right now. I'm a dwarf this time. Okay, so yeah, I'm further now. Um, I'm still in Act One. I'm in the Underdark in the um, Grim Forge, mm -hmm. the Dwergar's, you know, little realm. And I'm I'm looking. I think there's. I I just killed. I killed that Drow. Even though I think you're supposed to be friends with them, but I, I just murdered him and, uh, <laughs> and then fought some mimics. And then now I'm looking for like the adamantine forge. Okay. Yeah. I know about what. So you, you haven't had a chance to hook up with Housen in his bear form yet. I got you. I know. I think no, I, know I saw Housen in the bear form. Oh, did you? <laughs> but I mean, I haven't. I, no, no, no. But I haven't hooked up with him. <laughs> hooked up with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just. Uh, uh Lizelle, the githyanki full frontal i saw that <laughs> and then um and then i started started kind of moving to hook up with shadowheart like we made mm -hmm. out made out and then she murdered Lizelle. oh no she murdered Lizelle in your game but, that's well yeah because they were like hey do you want you know they, they give you the prompts do you want to jump in and it's like you know the two girls are fighting and i just chose like no i'm just gonna stand here and watch this and uh, and then she slit her throat. Dude, this is what I love about the game, though, is that like everybody I've talked to about it has a completely different experience. Man, it's so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I know it. it, it and I, yeah, I've, I've read, also read some really crazy, just crazy, crazy. Like to me, Baldur's three, Baldur's three is like what D and D is in my mind, not necessarily what it's been the past five years. Like mm -hmm. I think I think that the actual books and gameplay have gone a completely different direction from what you know Mike Merles and Rodney Thompson, Peter Lee, Rob Schwab, what 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 you know you would call Project I Iowa. Project Iowa was towards the end of fourth edition. They put together a little crack team to create a new edition of the game, which they thought was going to be the end. They mm -hmm. thought it was going to be over. Judging by the numbers of fourth edition, the vitriol towards um to you know towards that edition they decide it's over and everyone really left the game most people were playing pathfinder uh, or even more people were playing pathfinder and uh and so you know mike morales was put in charge of this team to try to figure out what to do next and um they started pulling the fans that were left over but mind you at that time you know, whoever was left during fourth edition, really, 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 they were diehard lovers of the game. And so when you reach out and you ask a really concentrated fan base what to do next, you're going to get good answers because they're people that have been with this thing from the jump. And, and this is what's wrong. And so the feedback was really fantastic for what went into fifth edition. And Merle's was smart enough, you know, he listened to it all. And so, you know, created this edition that then became the most popular tabletop gaming uh, a system of all time. I mean, it's not even close. The 50 million people during COVID that were playing, um, that mind you, is, is way less now. But that 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 peak 50 million during COVID, that's 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 Mike Marlson company. You know, I, I th they made a better edition than even Gary did. You know, I mean, you have to give all credit to Gary and Arneson and kind of the 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 gang in the Midwest, but but what Mike Merles did and, and company did with that game was is is mind blowing. And um, and then of course, you know, the Twitter mob rises up and 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 with the pitchforks and the torches, and it was right in that weird kind of spot when that all that was at its height, and everybody was really listening to the mob in that way. And um, there were some people within the company that saw their opportunity to try to go for Mike's head and get him out of the driver's seat. And um, and they were successful in the, and, and they were allowed to do it. And since then, it was kind of like I told, you know, I told Mike at one point, it's like Jimmy Johnson winning back to back Super Bowls with the Cowboys mm -hmm. and kicking him out, replacing him with Barry Switzer and then just dismantling the team. I mean, that's kind of what it was like. It yeah. was like. There were a bunch of people that got that, that that then saw their opportunity to take credit, try to take credit for what Mike did, try to launch and alter the game into a new edition. That um, and and it just has you know it's gone downhill ever since. So there was there was a pocket like five years ago of like two years that were just 
we everybody on the planet was so excited and that's when i i saw the opportunity um to uh you know to really really kind of help out with the company because it felt it felt punk rock to me you know everybody hated it <laughs> you know i mean like we loved it who played it but like the mainstream looked down on it it had this huge stigma it was satanic it was nerdy dorky you could get beat up for playing it and um you know and and i and i you know i, I want to be clear it wasn't so much that i was such a fan it was that i wanted to make dragonlance that was all i wanted so i i went to the company and 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 tried to get dragonlance going and what resulted was me becoming this official ambassador and paid consultant i was on, i've been on i was on payroll starting seven years ago and mm -hmm. and i stayed on payroll and i would help marketing i would go on talk shows for them i would um um you know i i i wrote adventure modules i created characters sold toys sold you know merchandise uh there were there were no t-shirts available that you could buy for dungeons and dragons online when i got started there was nothing and so I started my own company, Death Staves, and then got a licensing agreement to make cool stuff for them. And I was, I was making stuff for Game of Thrones and Dark Crystal. But but so, you know, while I was working on getting them to give me the rights to Dragonlance, I was also doing all of these other things on the side. And, and kind of what emerged was this Friday night celebrity D&D &D game at my house. And there were a whole bunch of my friends in entertainment that started coming back to playing that hadn't played since they were kids. And so then that became a whole big thing. So there were all these kind of ancillary side things that were going on, but the whole time, all I was doing was trying to get Dragonlance made. That was it. That was yeah. it. Just wanted Dragonlance. That was all. Yeah. You kind of touched uh, on a few things that I want to go back and, and, and touch on some more, but speaking of, we talked about this a little bit last time, but what is the current status of the live action Dragonlance show? So um, I was hired by my old boss, from HBO, Michael Lombardo. He took over at E1, which is the company that Hasbro acquired to run their entertainment properties. So Michael Lombardo takes over. It's my boss from True Blood. And, and the guy who greenlit Game of Thrones. And so I called Mike and said, hey, Mike, it's Joe. What's going on? And um, I said, hey, um, congratulations on taking over. Um, you guys have this series of books that I love. And there's like 220 of them. And uh, when I was a kid, there were like 12. Um, but uh, this is what they're like. And this is, you know, what the world is and da, da, da. And I kind of, you know, I just pitched him on the phone really quick. And he said, he said, we own that? And I said, yeah, you do. And he said, that's fantastic. He goes, when can you pitch? I said, tomorrow. He goes, no, 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 just we'll set up something for next week. But like, you know, can, you can pitch next week. I said, yeah, sure. So the following week I pitched, it was supposed to be a 20 minute pitch. It wound up being 90 minutes. Nobody wanted to get off the phone. The next morning, they called me back. They said, it's yours. Go for it. And so they hired me to develop it as a streaming series for D&D. &D. Yeah. And um, I got a writing partner, uh, this Australian, who had never read the books. Because I knew him well enough. I, I figured I'll be the dramaturg here. And, and you know, and, and, and we can co-write this thing together. And um, what, what really I was attracted to about this guy was that he was an identical twin. And I thought, okay, well, that has everything to do with the core of what's going to ride through the first six seasons. You know, there are these twins at the core. And uh, and he was a fantastic sci-fi writer and fantasy writer. And um, he started reading the books, and we started having these uh, kind of like, I don't know, um, tutoring sessions about the books and what, you know, what the... Uh, and, and, and when he had a question about things or could we go this way, could we go that way? It's like, I would kind of present multiple choices. We could do this, we could do this, or we could do this. And this is how they're supported through the books and blah, 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 blah. But really, and truly I had spent, you know, 30 years kind of breaking the story apart and figuring out where I could bend it and, and how much I could change it, how much I could alter it, how much I could deepen the relationships in the story, you know, and I, and I, I've always loved adaptation. My whole life, I've read a, I've read the book and then gone and seen the movie the next day, you know. And that was with Lord of the Rings. That was with you know Fight Club, American Psycho, you name it. Like I'm always curious to see how people take the written word and then alter them. And then, of course, 
you know, I had a front row seat at HBO for True Blood. True Blood was based on these kind of like summer romance novels. Right. And Alan Ball took them and really elevated all those ideas and elements and and really made it speak about something, speak about the human experience in a mythological way, a, a Campbellian way. And I'm I'm very much a student of Joseph Campbell and 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 Jung and um and that type of mythological storytelling. And so, you know, looking at Dragonlance through that lens, it was what's human about this. Okay, there's two brothers and 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 it's a codependent relationship. And 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 then I thought about visiting Graceland and I thought about Elvis was was meant to be twins. And his his twin brother was stillborn. And it, they have the little gravestone next to Elvis's on the the grounds of, of Graceland. And Elvis always believed that he was so uh, powerful as an individual because he absorbed the soul of his twin brother that didn't make it. And so that made me think about Carmen and Raceland in a world that, um, you know, D Dragonlance has been described as post-apocalypse. Now, we're not talking about the future of Terminator or something like that. We're right. talking about there was an apocalypse. And the, 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 the people... I'll call them the humanoids are now living in the shadow of this apocalypse that was caused as punishment by the gods who have now disappeared. So you're living in a godless world where steel is the currency. And when you look at earth, we've had a non, non shiny metallic currency once in our history as humans. And that was Sparta. Sparta's currency was steel, not gold. It was steel because you could make things from it. And it was this warrior society. So when you really start applying that, when you look at the clues that are in the book and you look at what wasn't maybe expounded upon, and 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 to me, the, the trading of steel pieces and steel, it, it's, it's a world where there is no magic. There is no healing. The gods are gone. And, and it's a warrior society. So you have these twins that are born and one is this strong, athletic, handsome warrior. And the other is like what is perceived to be what was left over. And so you think about the psychology of that character and how that character then turns from um, a sick boy into, you know, this God killer, this, this one who could potentially cause another apocalypse or the end of the world. And the only one that could stop him is his brother, his twin brother. And then you have to ask yourself the question, what would you, would you be willing? Would you be willing to kill the person that you love the most, who is closest to you, who you've defended and protected your whole life in order to save the rest of the world, including your wife and children? And now, now we're off and running. And yeah. also, what about a world in which the gods don't exist, but then one comes back? Or one, one is, one is, there, there, there's a man who's figured out how to bend the membrane between our world and the spirit realm where this God is imprisoned, where this God has been banished. And, and, and because he's bending the, the, the kind of the, 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 um, what's the word I'm looking for? The membrane of reality, this God's influence can come back and start helping this man, this emperor this evil wizard who's bringing her back. And because of her influence, these thousand year old dragons wake up and they, they come, they, they are now in service of this emperor and while they are awaiting him, figuring out how to finally fully pull her back into the world. And, and because of this energy coming through this membrane, one, one warrior winds up becoming sensitive to the power and becomes this kind of this prophet demigod in verminard and around him are these 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 they're not even like lieutenants they're these apostles who are watching the true you know divinity play out at his hand you know and through his voice and it's just you know you create this really rich world um the way that i see it now as you know a guy in his 40s rather than the 12 year old when i read it it was a different set of books to me when i was 12 than it is in my 40s you know looking at kitty r it's like i know who kitty r is i've dated kitty r you know like i know her and i know what caused her and i know what her relationship was like or not like with her dad you know and so you start really building that out um and tika same thing you know you start really seeing these characters in three dimensions and so you know i wrote this pilot script 
based upon, you know, it was, it was a, it, it's kind of a retelling that would be a fresh take for anybody who's read the books and go deeper. You know, what do you feed a dragon? I mean, think about it. That, that's not right. really explored in the books, but like, if just you, people. <laughs> I'm just kidding. well, if you've ever read anything about like the making of Lawrence of Arabia, all the horses, all the camels that were on the desert on this movie campaign for one week, if you look at what they had to feed those animals, it's absurd. So to think of a giant war campaign with a huge multi-ton dragon, like you're feeding them the people that you've captured out of the, the towns you've just taken over. So then that has to be accounted for. So there's, there are all of these, these, these kind of, you know, when, when you're thinking about, like I was going directing the episodes, writing the episodes, seeing them in three dimensions, going through in my mind, how we're going to block them, what the camera shots are as I'm writing. I'm thinking about what's going on in the background, what's going on in the white of those pages. And that becomes the adaptation. And, um, and coming from a very real place emotionally. So, you know, when I presented the pilot to Margaret and Tracy, you know, Tracy really, you know, kind of took a step back and said, you know, I mean, Tracy, Tracy, Tracy and Margaret were all about it and completely behind it and completely approved. But it really was um, me getting in there um, and and really fleshing out the world that they built and 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 a world that they hinted at in some places but but didn't really um they didn't shine the magnifying glass on it uh in, in the books and then what it gave me was an opportunity to then go in and and um and really mine all of that gold out that they had they had kind of left me a map of where the gold is and I, and it so it was up to me to really pull it out and, and what 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 came out of it was a really fresh take on on those novels that was absolutely 100 percent supported by all of the books but like i said i'm taking it a step further in right. a lot of ways in the way the true blood did and so true blood was really my model and of course i'm writing for my old boss at hbo michael lombardo and the team at e1 and then um e1 you know they they they, they got sold off so Michael Lombardo was no longer there as I was finishing my pilot. And the people who were real champions of my pilot were no longer there. And so um, the current regime at Wizards, I think because of the, um, the, you know, the way that Dragonlance was handled last year, the module that they released, that was not um, discussed with Margaret, Tracy, nor I, um, that failed board game that they released with it. Um, Dragonlance is not a property that they are interested in, in, in developing further currently. And, um, you know, that, that everyone who read the script, there was uh, like the biggest fantasy literary agent in town read it and said he, he this is these are his words not mine he said it was the best fantasy pilot he's read since the original game of thrones oh man you think about everything that's come in the past 15 years in fantasy yeah. he said it was the best fantasy pilot he's read there was another executive that read it and said it was one of the best fantasy scripts he's ever read i actually just got an email this morning from a producer who uh said it was awesome and and went on and on about it and wants to send it to the rest of his company and and in hopes that I will develop some other IP. Yeah. So, you know, I didn't write a script that was terrible. <laughs> and I could, you know, I mean, that could have very well been, you know, pat on the head, nice try. Sure. Thank you. You know, thanks for playing. But it wasn't. Everybody agrees that this script is amazing. Um, calls were made to say this is what you should be making this is what you should be doing and and currently it is to no avail so um either somebody's going to come into that company that's going to see the value of it and and realize that there is this script that's ready to go that i am electric about i mean what i had planned for the first season was going to be mind-blowing like i just i want to make it because i want to see it you know, and and I just want to feel that excited and electric about something. I I, the 
the characters, like the casting. I have a, you know, a giant lookbook that's like over a thousand images and it's not what you expect. The, 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 the design concepts that I had for the world, for the armor, for the swords, like it's just the dragons. I, I had a kind of a fresh take on how, what the dragons were going to look like. I, I just, it was going to be like nothing anyone has ever seen. And it's with these beloved characters that are read by, I think Tracy said there's 35 million books in circulation. Right. These are established beloved characters in a New York times bestselling series. I, I made it very clear. I wasn't adapting the game. I'm adapting these novels, these beloved characters. I'm not starting from a blank slate the way that the movie did. Right. These are characters that people know and love. And um, and uh, and so, you know, maybe somewhere down the line, somebody comes back and says or the or the, you know, whatever the the, uh, the company switches hands and somebody sees the value. But for right now. Um, and I also offered to buy it. I offered to buy Dragonlance. Um, you know, I, I was I was I was talking to people with funds, with money to try to yeah. get it and separate it just so just so that I could get the option and take it out on the town and, and that's um, that's a no-go to no there's there's a there they do not they are not interested in developing dragon lance currently oh god oh. that sucks because the way you just pitched it is sounds incredible is that i mean do you think that is there anything fans can do to help you know maybe change some minds man you know i don't know um you know i i just on a personal level it's like as an artist you know, as a performer, as a writer, director, whatever, um, I think the number one thing an artist wants is to feel like they're understood. You know, and and I loved what Denny Villeneuve said about when said about Dune when he made the first Dune movie. They said, Denny, you know, there's a lot of fans of this, of uh, of these novels and uh, and of Herbert. And who did you make this film for? How do you decide who to make this film for? And he said, Easy, I made it for Dune's number one fan me you know and uh and that's how i i feel about dragon um and so if there are other people who love it the way that that i do um just i don't know like let me know you feel it too you know um and and hopefully someday they'll be able to see it you know i i really hold out hope i i, I can't i just can't see how something that's getting this kind of reviews that that I am, you know, that passionate about and that the passion can is translating into, you know, I, I wrote the script. I wrote the script that 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 I dreamed of writing and and um it's there. It's just it's just waiting to go. So um you know I I the the trick you know I, I don't know it's 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 D D to me is an art form, not a game. It's something that that gives. It's an American art form, the way that comic books are, the way that jazz, hip hop, and and tabletop role playing. It um, it gives you the agency to create your own world. And I was a creative who was actually created by tabletop role playing. I learned how to build characters, write, direct, produce. I learned all of it. Let's tell long form narrative storytelling. All of that I learned from from tabletop, and I and I love the purity of it. Um, but I understand that we live in a world where anything artistic is seen as a commodity. And, um, and it's about, do we think we can make money? And, and you know, but I've always said, I want to see Dungeons and Dragons. I want to see Dragonlance up there on a stage winning awards. Right. You know, forget about over monetizing or under monetizing. Forget about all that. I want to see this thing win awards. I want to see people cry. I want to see people standing up in their living room, screaming at a TV when it, when it goes to black. I, I want people on the edge of their seats for the next week, talking about it, picking the books back up. Um, you know, um, and and like I said, Margaret and Tracy are completely on board, and uh, and and everybody else who's read it is too. So hopefully some hopefully someday. Um, but that is my passion project. It's why I got involved with Dungeons and Dragons in the first place. Yeah. Um, it, it was to make Dragonlance. And and I I won't say I completed my mission, but I, I hit the first check post, which was to turn in um turn in the 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 the, 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 the script that I was proud of. 
Dude, your passion is contagious. And I mean, just your excitement for it makes me excited for it and sad that it's not coming right now. So, I mean, I really hope something changes or somebody sees this. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting. It's like, you know, there's a lot of fans that have wondered what happened and, and and I'm, you know, I'm talking to you about it, you know, and, and so, you know, and, and there's some of it that's like, I don't know if it's me, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to like slam D and D to an extent, but I understand that by me saying what happened to my project, honestly, you know, it's kind of like, I don't know, somebody over there might get upset, but it's kind of like, all right, well, it, right. it, it, it kind of, you know, it is what it is. I was hired to do this thing by my old boss at HBO. I wrote an HBO version of Dragonlance. I mean, it's, it's HBO. There's, there's sex and there's violence and there's love and there's loss and there's codependency and, you know, all of those really, really right. human deep, deep issues. I wrote, I wrote a series for, for an HBO or for a streamer that mm -hmm. would be appealed to kids, you know, appeal to the young person that I was, but also really appeal to to adults as well. Um, well and, and to your point too, it's like you're you're not adapting a book series that is not finished. I mean, you you have so much stuff that you could you could take from. I mean, yeah. so well, and, and I want to say like like the first six books are the core. The the first six are the core. And and it's meant for for three TV series, like for three seasons of, multi, of you know, three multiple episodes, you know, three seasons, and then three movies. I think Legends are three movies but I cherry picked from the 220 novels. So if there's an idea that I like, I would pull that over here. Something that I can link up to in the future, I pull it over here. There are things that set off or, or things that happen in the pilot that I put in there to pay off in season four. That you would watch season four and go, whoa, wait a minute, and go back to season one and go, you know, like, because I have the benefit of now having all the novels in front of me. You know, but mind you, what Margaret and Tracy wrote for those first six books, that's canon to me. The rest of it, you can kind of, you know, and, and sometimes you need to, you know, you, you, you need to bend things to make them a little more, like, like make, make more sense, or at least they're going to serve a greater purpose. Or, you know, it, it's very clear to me why, for example, like, they go away to find God. And you're like, well, that's Tracy going on his Mormon mission. Right. But if everybody goes at the same time for the same reason, I don't have as much runway to develop the characters and I have to develop an entire set of Avengers at once, which is, you know. Yeah, but so it, but if I make them all leave home for a different reason, then I get to tell their stories separately so that I can I, ha I now have the runway to develop why they all left and the point is that they've all come back together to liberate their town so they're all coming back together but then i also had to stagger them and things that things in the books that happened off stage Sturm saying hey i found these people on the side of the road they have this magical item you know it's if i don't if i don't have him come on stage and say that and 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 kind of expositionally dictate that well, if I stagger their entry later, then I can tell the full story in one episode with flashbacks and, and kind of give the strangers on the road their own episode to develop. That, that So it doesn't have to all be crammed into one. And also, there's a lot in it that was derivative of The Hobbit. There's an old man in gray robes moving tables around for a dinner party that's about to happen. It's like, well, that's, the, that's in The Hobbit um but but they've put out hobbit movies since then so because that's in the culture and, and in the zeitgeist you know very strongly visually um i i have to i got to figure out a different way around that right um, to give you something fresh something new something unexpected but ultimately don't worry if we if, we're, if you feel like we're off the path over here i'm gonna bring you back we'll come back to the path <laughs> you know at some yeah, point, yeah, yeah. At some point and it'll all make sense so Dude, well, I'm, I'm, look, fingers crossed. I know I'm not the only one who hopes that some minds get changed and this, this gets going for you, dude. Cause you're clearly, I mean, you've put 
so much work into it. I, I hope it happens for you, man. So Thanks, again, man. well, yeah, and I think it's it was kind of like to to make it clear because there's so many people that are like, oh, you're such a big fan of D and D, and it's like, hey, I, I've been an employee of D and D for 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 a while now. So, mm-hmm. and I think people didn't put that together in their mind. They just kind of thought, oh, this guy, you know, and it's just he's a you know champion of the brand, and it's like, well, I'm I'm trying to make Dragonlance, and right. in the meantime, um, there was a guy at the company who I think saw value in 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 using me to help promote the brand and and i did so um you know while uh you know while merles was in charge yeah definitely i I did a lot of stuff with merles given the recent success of like fantasy animated shows like vox machina and dragon prince etc would you ever consider creating like an animated D &D series instead of a live action one yeah i well i mean i don't know if it's for D &D, you know what i mean i just Mm want to say that like like I said, I love, I love the art form of Dungeons and Dragons. I love what Gary Gygax created. I love what was carried on by, you know, Steve Winter and company, and Zeb Cook, and you know, Dave Grubb, and Tracy Hickman is a hero of mine. Not only because of the Dragonlance novels, but he and Laura Hickman, his wife, created Ravenloft, which I think changed narrative storytelling at the table forever um they designed the world of dragonlance which then created a long form narrative inside of tabletop gaming and what tracy's doing with his new world uh the sky raiders of abarax like to me that's what the next kind of like the next evolution of fifth edition dungeons and dragons should have been could have been is sky raiders of abarax and um, he ran a Kickstarter for it last year, and I've been able to read it. And he asked me to help him, you know, work on it and conceptualize. And to me, it's 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 he's just he is the greatest storytelling talent in role playing. Um, he was, you know, he really did take the mantle from Gary Gygax. Now, when um, you were talking about wanting to like write and direct these episodes, did you have a particular like character in mind that you wanted to play? I wasn't. This wasn't about me playing a character at all. Um, I, I did not write and create, I think there's a lot of people online who somehow think that I'm doing this with Dragonlance because I'm an actor and I want to, you know, like this is some vanity prod and it's not at all. I wasn't, I wasn't even thinking about playing anyone. It, it wasn't about that. I'm too old for Carmen. Carmen and Raceland need to be young. They're unmarried men. You can't be 40, whatever. You know what I mean? It, it's going to be creepy. You have, you know, like this is all age appropriate. And they were the kids, they were the fatherless kids running around in the street that had to kind of be kept in check. You know, they they were, their mother was driven mad because she had magic ability and, uh, and their father was nowhere to be seen. And then they had an older sister, half sister, whose father was nowhere to be seen. So they were kind of these fatherless rascals, you know, running around in the town of Solace. And so when you look at it that way and you go, okay, well, Sturm would be a little bit older because Sturm would have been the one who was grabbing them by the ear and dragging them home and trying to, you know, teach them something about being men, you know, or young men. And um, Kitty Yara would kind of be absent, but she's a little bit older. So then you're looking at Tannis, even though he's, you know, 50 or 85, you know, like he's somewhere in, in that age range, but, but feels like he's, a little bit older than Kitty Ara, you know? Um, so, so, you know, when you're, when you're really talking about those characters, they're, they're younger than me. Um, I did write Verminard in a way that, um, you know, he's this big, you know, tattooed, ruined warrior priest and speaks in riddles that that i would relate to like the old testament almost he's like an old testament preacher and um yeah i mean and and he and he's he's kind of mad you know a bit mad and um you know when when you get into that you kind of think well okay well who who's this big athletic muscular person that's going to be delivering these like classical speeches um and you kind of go, well, 
if I couldn't find anybody in a casting search, a worldwide casting search, so then maybe, may, maybe I go, okay, fine. You know, I, I, my, 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 my show running partner can watch the monitors that day and I'm going to go work, you know? Um, but, um, but for the most part, no, I mean, you know, my job, my job is to write the scripts, write the screenplays, prep and direct the episodes and the episodes that I'm not prepping and directing when another director is, is in the process of prepping. I am going over to, to work with them and make sure I'm running a writer's room, which also takes a lot. You know, I, I am map boarding this thing. I mean, the, the whole room would be whiteboards of beautiful mind. And because there's timelines and time travel and, you know, locations and character arcs and love triangles. And I mean, and, and so I would be in there running that and answering questions and monitoring. I would be touching every single script that came through for the whole season. I'd also be meeting with all the departments, weapons, armor, costuming, set design, production, VFX crew, sound department. I mean, music, the orchestra, like everything. So, so several full-time jobs without even worrying about acting. Oh, this is what I would be doing for the next decade. And, and it would be, I mean, it's just, that's it. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, like that, that, that's, you know, I, I don't have time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. but, but it's also, it's okay. You know, um, I, I think that a lot of my career kind of has pushed me into a position. It's pushed me away from acting to a certain degree. Yeah. Um, if you look at like Superman, Batman, you know, there's, there's a couple other roles, you know, but I mean, it's like, you look at the way that things went for me and there were a couple other gigantic, gigantic roles that I signed the contracts for and was ready to do that fell apart that I don't need to go into right now. But like, it was just a weird series of events that kind of led me towards really towards directing and, and writing. And which is what I've been doing for the past. Now, I, sort of, I sort of want to go back to what you said earlier about Baldur's Gate being sort of like a classic idea of what you thought of D and D to originally be, and and sort of get you know where the the more modern stuff has got away from that a little bit. Are you excited for more digital immersion in video games like Baldur's Gate, or do you think you'll always prefer the traditional tabletop D and D experience? Um, I think there's room for both. I mean, I. I was a part of a video game, a D&D &D video game a few years ago. I did the voice of, of, I played the big boss at the end, this big frost giant Jarl, and uh, and it fell on its face. And there was also supposed to be a Dragonlance video game that fell apart. Um, there have been, a, I mean, The Witcher was supposed to go to Dungeons and Dragons. They developed that software, went to Dungeons and Dragons and said, we, we have, you know, we're, 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 we, we have this thing ready to go. Um, we just need the IP. And they said no. And so they went to Sapowski and it became the Witcher. So, you know, I, I, I'm all about quality. I, I just want quality in, in whatever incarnation. And, and it doesn't matter if it's Dungeons and Dragons. It doesn't matter if it's GURPS, you know, or or freaking, you know, whatever. I mean, I I played the an alien tabletop game at Gen Con this year, and it was phenomenal. And I want to go run that. Um, you know, I want to I want to run Tracy's Sky Raiders of Abrax campaign. As soon as it comes out, I'm going to switch over to that and start playing that. So I'm running that for my group. So you know, it it just um, it's not even so much D and D specific. I just like seeing fantasy done right. I like seeing comic books done right. I like seeing Star Wars done right. I like seeing, you know, um, anything mythological, fantasy, sci-fi based that talks about kind of the one story that we all share from different perspectives, what, what mythology is supposed to do. I like seeing that handled by people who actually have affinity for it, who actually understand it. What I hate is people cavalierly going public and saying, well, I don't read comic books and I get to make comic book movies now. It's like, get out, get out. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Get out, get mm -hmm. out of my sport, you know? So, or just keep doing what you're doing. And what it's going to do is usher in a whole new batch of people that actually do know what they're doing. So, right. um, you know, and I don't want to come off as pompous by saying that it's just, I hate seeing it mangled. Right. No, I totally understand. So, so um, it's like I, I, I think Baldur's Gate three. I think Larian Studios did an unbelievable job. I think they they captured exactly what it was. It was the right amount of violence, sex, 
uh, darkness, her heroism. I, I think it, it's it's everything, and yeah. and you really feel like you have the agency to tell that story um, by yourself. And the mechanics are unbelievable, you know. Oh, so it, it, it's fantastic. It's so fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Just a just a personal question: who who is the funniest or most creative celebrity you think you've played D and D with? Like, who would you oh, say that it goes to? Oh man, I mean, God. All right, well. It, you're, you're at, this is like Sophie's choice. You're asking the dungeon master to pick his favorite player. You know, <laughs> um, you know, I, you know, it's it's kind of a tie in my mind um, between a few people. Um, Tom Morello's commitment to adventure is 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 almost unparalleled. Uh, Tom Morello, I'm currently running Ravenloft for my group. And Tom is playing a Vishtani. He's doing an accent, like a Romanian accent, like full on. He, he, his backstory is unbelievable. Like, so he, like, I, I, I really, you know, I, I, I really love it when the, when the players get so into it that they also have a voice and they have this character that they slip into. Um, Vince Vaughn is another one who um, he's always Vince is like a master min maxer, but, but also like for the story, like, but he'll create some kind of amazing character. He has got this bugbear gloom stalker and the amount of dice that he rolls on his first attack every round because of this like darkness and visibility of, you know, the, the, the ability of the gloom stalker is, is really crazy, but he also like, you know, He's always, you know, he he turns into Vince. I mean, I've I've had dungeon master player exchanges with him. There was one in the last campaign. He was playing a sorcerer where he was haggling with me to try to get a larger magic carpet at a lower price. At the price of the, there's three sizes of magic carpet. Trying to get the big magic carpet for the medium price, and I kept trying to sell him the medium one for the medium price, and it went on for about ten minutes, and. um and it was like Vince from Swingers, basically, like trying to haggle. And so it's <laughs> hilarious. And the rest of the table's laughing. And um, my trainer, Ron Matthews, who is a former CrossFit champion and um, and a competitive bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's the biggest, one of the biggest fantasy nerds I've ever met. He's read every single fantasy novel. He can cite them all. And his characters that he comes up with are nothing short of legendary. He is so funny. So, and he wrote this monologue. His character got reincarnated after he was killed and they chopped his hand off and reincarnated him. And he he said, stop. And then he just read this monologue that he had written. And it was unbelievable, like it blew us all away. So, you know, everybody kind of has their moment at the table. And um, and that's what I love seeing. And I love being able to, you know, like I said, it, it doesn't really feel like a game so much as much as it's collaborative storytelling. And right. my job is to create an atmosphere where people feel like they can grab the microphone and take agency and really bring something to the table. And mind you, these are all, you know, some of the most decorated professionals. I mean, one of the best days dungeon mastering of my life was looking in my email inbox and getting a like five page backstory for from Dave Benioff for his character in the campaign. And I just went and made a big pot of coffee. I had these uh, Tanzanian pea berry coffee that I was waiting to brew and I ground up the beans. I made a nice pot. I went out in the backyard and, and I sat with my coffee and just read Dave Benioff's backstory for his character. And it was mind blowing. Holy shit. That's so awesome. That is yeah, that's so it's, cool. It's really man. cool.